tonight, frustration in the B.C. interior as some refuse to leave their homes. They decide to say no and not to go. Why? You lose everything when you can like, literally fight it. The tension between homeowners and fire crews. They are putting themselves at an extremely high amount of danger. Why some residents say they feel abandoned. A daring rescue. School kids trapped on a broken cable car dangling hundreds of meters in the air. Be and the Toronto Raptors sue. I was quite shocked. The allegation? A conspiracy to steal from a rival team. This is The National with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. Well, the wildfires are starting to ease tonight in parts of B.C.'s interior, but a sense of grief and frustration is growing. Some residents saying they've had to protect their, their homes themselves. New satellite images show the fires are still burning, but some of the thick smoke has started to clear. Crews are still assessing the damage. Today, fire officials in the Okanagan said close to 200 properties were either fully or partially destroyed. Now, those losses are in the West Kelowna region and include the West Bank First Nation. Further north in the Shuswap, the exact number of homes lost isn't yet known. So some residents in that area say their homes were only saved because they defied evacuation orders and stayed behind to fight the flames, a decision the province says could put lives at risk. Renee Filipponi shows us the growing tensions on the front lines. Yeah, the host that was there was was a super nice house. Along the north shore of Shishwap Lake, waterfront homes have burned to the ground. The fire leaving only chairs on the beach and a Canadian flag. What's the level of frustration of people in this area? Right here. It's, it's, up, it's up there. Darren Tuoko takes us on a tour of the destruction. He's been ferrying people and supplies into evacuated areas. He says some who defied the orders were able to save their homes. People just, you know, they decide to say no and not do go. Why? And lose everything when you can literally fight it. You got pumps, water right here. I'd do the same. Where's no our what your job looks like. Mm -hmm. Everybody's, Our, everything's burning like around the us. There are growing tensions between police enforcing evacuation orders and residents who stayed behind. Officials continue to stress it's not safe to be there among the fallen trees and downed power lines. And they are putting themselves at an extremely high amount of danger going into a, a fire impacted area. Oh my God. BC Wildfire Service says this was one of the most aggressive fires it's ever seen. It even forced crews to pull back at one point. This video shows how some residents fought the flames to save their homes. These people out there right now, they're putting their life on the line and they're proud of it. Avery Schof and his son stayed too. He defends their decision, saying he has the right to protect his home. They're not going to give up and they're not really good at following rules. They know what's happening. We feel like we've been abandoned. This resident I'm also stayed to document I'm, what's I'm going on. She says the community needs much more support. Are. But there are some many people that have lost their homes, some people who have lost their businesses, and some people who have lost their homes and businesses here. Some evacuees took their concerns directly to BC's premier on his first visit to the fire zones. They're getting arrested. There are police boats at the shore stopping supplies, fuel, you know, for generators. People in Inglemont running out of food. They're trying to help boat stuff over. Like, where's the logic in that? I... People safe is number one, right? And Renee, you're in Kelowna tonight, and I gather you asked the Premier directly about what these residents are saying. Adrian, Premier Eby says he understands the frustration, but is urging people to listen to frontline responders and stay out of the evacuation areas. Right now, the concern is if the fires flare up again, these resources will be needed to rescue people and not fight the fires. There are currently 200 wildfire and municipal firefighters working in the Shishwap area. The BC Wildfire Service says there is increased police presence because of these tensions. They've seen people drive around roadblocks or move around essential equipment equipment and they're urging everyone to work together. All right, Renee Filipponi in Kelowna, thank you. You're welcome.
Crews in the Northwest Territories are working to tackle a number of wildfires that are still threatening communities, including the capital. Water bombers and rain are helping in that fight. As Madeline Cummings shows us, volunteers are doing what they can to support those who fled to Alberta. I think this will probably be gone today. Arlene Wheeler's backyard has become a drop-in donation center. With more than 700 evacuees from the Northwest Territories registered in her small city of Leduc, just south of Edmonton, she figured people would need supplies. And she was right. More than 60 have asked for help so far. After days away from home, evacuees are running out of clean clothing. They need food. In the rush, one family left without their stroller. Expenses are adding up. The cost of it all beyond some families' budgets. And so, a helping hand. It's pretty emotional for a lot of people, for sure. Um, especially when somebody said to me, uh, he said, you're renewing my faith in humanity. And so that was like, whoa. <laughs> Some evacuees don't have vehicles, so volunteers are going to them, visiting hotels and a local campground. Others are collecting donations in Edmonton. A local baseball club even opened its doors to families. So people can have some fun and take their minds off matters for a few hours. Evacuees say they appreciate the hospitality. Everybody's been praying for us. That's so amazing, you know, like strangers. And then I went on the taxi with a lady I just met. She wouldn't let me pay for the cab and stuff like this. People are just gold, you know. Help is also heading north, with communities in Western Canada sending firefighters and equipment to Yellowknife. These fire trucks sent in from the city of Edmonton. Rain has offered some help in the firefight there, but it's not enough. And wildfires still threaten several other communities in the territory. It is definitely not safe to come back to these communities. Evacuees know they won't be going back for a while. So for now, Alberta will be their home away from home. And volunteers are helping make that a little easier. Madeline Cummings, CBC News, Edmonton. School is also a major concern for evacuees right now. And today, Yellowknife and the area schools confirmed the academic year will not begin with virtual learning, saying school will start when students are able to return in person. Now, Quebec's fire season has broken records, and tonight scientists have some hard numbers on just how much worse climate change has made it. Alison Northcott now with the pretty stark findings. In Quebec alone, wildfires have burned more than 5 million hectares this summer, a record level of destruction. In the Cree community of Waswanapi, hundreds had to evacuate. Family trap lines and cabins burned. We're still even just trying to figure out how much are we impacted just by this one fire, never mind trying to figure out how are we going to, um, you know, deal with the impacts of future fires. Now, new research found human-induced climate change made Quebec's fires twice as likely to happen and more intense. It is alarming and shocking because the impacts of climate change on wildfires are very, very high. An international group of scientists studied weather data and climate models to see what role climate change played in the fires and what could be in store in the future. These conditions are, will not happen, happen every year uh, from, from now, but they have they are much more likely to happen in the future. We already know that within the 2023 climate, such event could occur once every 20 to 25 years. And he says if temperatures keep rising, they could be more frequent. Studies like this are important to help prepare, says this climate data scientist. And based on that, the decision makers, the agencies, the all the organizations that are involved for the policy makings try to use the knowledge and the science that are um, generated by such models and studies and then try to adapt. Something communities still reeling from this year's fires are already thinking about. This land loss, it's a loss of a way of life for us. You know, we depend on having access to trap lines. We depend on having access to the wildlife habitats. That means in some places years of recovery. The study also points to the impact on economic activities like forestry. More than a million hectares of commercial forest have been affected and Quebec's fire season isn't over. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. Our senior climate correspondent, Susan Ormiston, is in northwestern Quebec tonight looking at the remnants of the big fires there. Susan, what else are we learning about the severity of this summer's fire season? 
Well, you know, Adrian, as we usually think about the risk to human life or the property loss, there's another big phenomenon happening, and that's emissions. Fires across Canada have already produced more than double the usual CO2 emissions, and that's more than almost any other fire season anywhere in the world over the last two decades. So Canada's breaking records on those emissions, which we don't want. What else are, are you learning there? Well, as we heard already, the fires here in Quebec were made 50% more severe by the effects of climate change. And scientists here are now looking at the carbon footprint. What changes are happening to a boreal forest, which, you know, historically is known as a carbon sink. That is, it takes in CO2 or greenhouse gases from the atmosphere, but now it's at risk of giving off more than it's taking in. So the scientists are looking at that and what it means for our entire calculation of CO2 emissions. All right, just a sense of what's come. You'll have more on that story for us soon on The National. Indeed. Susan Ormiston in Quebec tonight. Thank you. In Maui, a staggering number of people are still missing two weeks after wildfires ripped through parts of the island. Between 500 to 1,000 people remain unaccounted for. Officials are still trying to determine how many made it to safety but haven't checked in and how many actually died. And in Greece, officials found 18 bodies in a remote area where wildfires have been raging. The forested region is along a route often used by migrants. In northern Pakistan tonight, an incredible, daring rescue with a remarkable outcome. Eight people stranded on a cable car, hundreds of meters in the air, are safely on the ground. The majority of them are children as young as 10 years old. Chris Brown takes us through the terrifying 14 hours. After more than 12 hours dangling around 300 meters up and only scary options for getting down, this young man got a huge cheer from his rescuers as he was pulled to safety. He, his schoolmates and at least one adult were left hanging precariously when one of two cables on a rudimentary cable car snapped. All were on their way to school, and as often is the practice in Pakistan's rugged, isolated mountain valleys, they were taking the cable car for a faster trip. Reached by phone, a 20-year-old man trapped on board pleaded with a Pakistani television outlet to be rescued. I don't know exactly what happened, but the cable broke, he said. Military helicopters tried to get close and did manage to dramatically winch one person to safety, but high winds added to fears that the downdraft could have caused the gondola to fall. On the ground, government representatives pleaded for patience. Our special unit is coming, he said, but villagers, furious with the delay, demanded they be allowed to improvise. Doesn't the government have enough resources to save the lives of those innocent children, asked one man, whose son and brother were on the cable car. In the end, rescuers shimmied out onto the remaining cable and in what must have been a terrifying ordeal, inched each person in darkness along the cable to safety. Deadly cable car accidents are not uncommon in Pakistan. The country's prime minister has now ordered every such system to be inspected. Chris Brown, CBC News, London. Back in Canada, three people were sent to hospital following a large explosion in northern BC this morning. It happened in Prince George in a building that wasn't occupied, but some of the surrounding buildings in the city's downtown did have people inside. I came out here and there was like a huge black cloud of smoke. It's morning, it felt like a, a car hit our building. <laughs> Witnesses shared some video of the chaotic scenes immediately after the explosion. One of the victims is in critical condition. Police are treating this incident as suspicious, but say they are still early in the investigation. The federal government is considering a major move to release some pressure from the rental market, capping the number of international students who can come to Canada. J.P. Tasker looks at the potential impact. International student Harshal Basgowry is starting at Toronto's George Brown College in the fall. But the search for an affordable place to live isn't going well. If I'm going to be honest, I, I'm always moments away from like a mental breakdown, just from the stress of 
um, wondering if I'm going to be homeless soon. Now, with Canada facing an acute shortage of affordable housing, Ottawa is considering a limit on the number of international students it allows in. There is some abuse in the system, and we have to address this in a smart way. It includes potentially looking at a cap. There are more than 800,000 foreign students at Canadian universities and colleges. An eye-popping figure Ottawa believes has driven up the price of rent in some spots. The micro-inflationary pressure that international students present in certain areas of the country, and notably in big cities, is real. And that can leave renters vulnerable to scams and bad landlords. It's not fair for the students who come to be exploited and left without adequate housing. This foreign student advocate is all for better homes, but he's leery of a cap. He doesn't want to see the door slam shut. International students are not causing, you know, the housing crisis. It is actually, you know, uh, the greedy people who, uh, who take housing as an investment. This professor has been tapped by the Prime Minister to help solve the housing crunch. His suggested fix? Student visas tied to a place to live. What that would do is create incentives for the colleges and universities to create on-campus housing. Post-secondary schools say they are building housing, but they want more financial support from the federal government. Any enrollment cap wouldn't be in effect this school year, but with housing a pressing political issue, the government's determined to answer its critics. J.P. Tasker, CBC News, Charlottetown. The chief of staff to Ontario's housing minister has resigned. Ryan Amato played a key role in the Ontario government's controversial move to open up thousands of hectares of protected land known as the Green Belt for housing development. The province's Auditor General found Amato selected most of the sites after being lobbied by developers. And mercenary leader Yevgeny Prigozhin appears to have given his first video address since his short-lived rebellion in Russia back in June. So this video was posted to a Telegram channel affiliated with Prigozhin's Wagner Group. It's not clear where or, or when the video was taken, but it's believed to be somewhere on the continent of Africa. For the past couple of months, his exact whereabouts remain unknown. A group of countries trying to position itself as an alternative to the Western economic world is looking to expand. BRICS is formed by Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa. And leaders from those countries are in Johannesburg tonight, except for one. Briar Stewart explains why. There was South African hospitality as the leaders arrived in Johannesburg one by one. Except for Russia's president, Vladimir Putin. Still, he was greeted with a large cheer at the BRICS forum as a pre-recorded message was played. Russia is being deliberately obstructed, he said, referring to sanctions levied against his country. Putin didn't go to South Africa because he could be arrested. The country is a signatory to the International Criminal Court, which has accused him of war crimes. But there was no talk of that publicly. Instead, the focus was on the power and the potential of BRICS. The once emerging economies that together now account for a quarter of the world's GDP. The group wants to expand and push for what they call a multipolar world and erode what they see as Western dominance. The BRICS family is growing in its importance, in its stature, and also in its influence in the world. Officials say 40 countries are interested in joining the group. Among them, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Venezuela and Algeria. This lecturer who teaches about BRICS says the countries all have their own vision for expansion. For the host South Africa, it could include admitting more members to balance out the politics of Russia and China. BRICS as a group in order to show that actually this is not a grouping of authoritarian leaning states that's trying to fight against Western hegemony. It's expected BRICS leaders will discuss and debate how many new members to welcome and which countries. And while Ukraine is not at the top of the agenda, the economic and political consequences of Russia's war will be hard to avoid. Briar Stewart, CBC News, London. Tropical storm Harold slammed into South Texas and northern Mexico today, bringing powerful winds and some welcome rain to the region. 
So it made landfall near Corpus Christi mid-morning. The winds immediately downed power lines, cutting off tens of thousands of customers. Heavy rain risked flash flooding, but after months of such dry conditions, meteorologists say all that water could actually be helpful. And in California, a huge cleanup effort is underway after another tropical storm, this one named Hillary, hit on Sunday. Crews are trying to clear mud-clogged streets in Palm Springs and nearby Cathedral City, where some residents had to be helped out by some heavy equipment Monday. This was the first tropical storm to hit Southern California in more than 80 years. Well, the Toronto Raptors are being accused of stealing information from the New York Knicks, and the team is taking legal action. There's going to be email tra uh, trails. There's going to be timelines. Who is being named in the lawsuit? The bigger question is, what part do the Raptors play in this? And the potential fallout. A shooting in Canada's biggest mall sends police on a search for suspects. We are incredibly lucky that nobody lost their lives. The status of the investigation and the victims, plus. Running scared or solid strategy? It's one of the largest leads that we've seen in an open presidential primary where there wasn't an incumbent. Breaking down Donald Trump's decision to skip Republican debates. We're back in two. In Edmonton, police have found both a handgun and a vehicle they believe are linked to last night's shooting at the West Edmonton Mall. We are incredibly lucky that nobody lost their lives yesterday, that no innocent people were injured. The gigantic retail centre was locked down after an exchange of gunfire between four men who were leaving the mall and a shooter or shooters in a white SUV. Three of the men targeted were wounded and apprehended. A fourth escaped. Police any, like, believe they have found that SUV. And a plea of not guilty today from Sam Bankman-Fried, founder of the FTX cryptocurrency exchange. He's facing seven new fraud charges. His lawyer said the man formerly known as the crypto king is now subsisting on bread and water because the federal prison he's at will not serve vegan meals. Well, the Toronto Raptors are being sued by one of their NBA rivals. The New York Knicks say not only did the Raptors get access to stolen information, but Raptors employees had a direct part in how they got it. Travis Danraj now on a potential blockbuster off-the-court story. R.J. Barrett attacking. The allegations are stunning. An employee of the New York Knicks stealing trade secrets for the Raptors. The potential fallout for Canada's team, significant. Shot doesn't go. It looks pretty bad. The Knicks allege that their former video analytics and player development assistant took over 3,000 files from a secure server in the days before he began working for the Raptors. Everything from confidential game analysis to scouting reports to a prep book for last season. I think the bigger question is, is, as well is, what part do the Raptors play in this? Was this of his own volition that he decided, okay, well, now that I've got this job, let's see how much more I can bring over? Or was it, did, was it led by Darko Ryakovich? Thank you, first of all, everybody coming out. Rajakovich is the Raptors' new head coach and is specifically named in the lawsuit. It's his first time heading up an NBA team. We have a brand new head coach that doesn't have the, what they allege, he didn't have the ability to bring in his own staff. And then what they're trying to do is sort of poach other people to um, kind of create a, a, a skeleton staff based on other people's know-how. The pleadings are saying that they took a shortcut, you know, took a cheat sheet from someone else. Reaction today from fans of both teams. Hell yes, legitimate. They, they deserve to be sued. If they have proof, then I guess uh, we'll see what happens. So they're one of our rivals. So, I mean, that would give us a leg up. I just think uh, we don't need help beating the Knicks. Here's Scotty B. The NBA hasn't commented, but the league's former director of security says it shouldn't be hard to find out if any wrongdoing took place. There's going to be email tra uh, trails, there's going to be timelines. You're going to be able to put together a picture of, of what happened and didn't happen. Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment, which owns the Raptors, denies any involvement in what's alleged, but says it's cooperating and has launched its own investigation. Travis Stanrash, CBC News, Toronto. The first Republican primary debate is set for tomorrow, but the runaway favorite will not be there. You have to really wonder why he would 
go potentially because he would be faced with hard questions. The reason for Donald Trump's decision and the potential impact on the campaign. Seeking asylum at all costs. We hear all kinds of stories every day, heartbreaking stories of people that have gone through hardship just to get to this point. The dangerous journeys being taken in an effort to get to Canada. The National takes you deeper into the story shaping your world. Next. Do you still think the election was stolen? Absolutely. Absolutely. Still. No question. Well, that's Donald Trump's former lawyer, John Eastman, today, speaking today after he turned himself in to face multiple charges. Along with Trump and others, he was indicted last week for an alleged plot to overturn the results of the 2020 U.S. presidential election. So Trump says he will surrender to authorities on Thursday, so he will be free for Wednesday night's first crucial debate among Republicans who want to run for president. But here's the thing. Donald Trump has no intention of taking part in that debate. Here's Andrew Chang to break down the reasons why. If you're planning to watch the first Republican primary debate on Fox, you're going to notice something's missing. Former President Trump slammed by some of his GOP rivals for planning to skip the first Republican debate next week in Milwaukee. Yeah, that's right. Trump just isn't showing up. And that's a big deal because he's the man everyone would want to hear. The clear frontrunner for the Republican nomination. Our survey found 62% of likely primary voters support Trump. Governor Ron DeSantis is second with just 16%. It's one of the largest leads that we've seen in an open presidential primary where there wasn't an incumbent. And so uh, I think that for Trump, it, it's really just about avoiding some kind of a misstep, being pressed on some of these issues that he hasn't really been because he hasn't been running a more fulsome campaign. Yes, Trump's refusal to defend himself on a national stage is a very calculated move. So let's break down three strategic reasons why Trump is skipping the first and maybe all of the Republican primary debates. Here's Trump's justification for skipping out, in his own words, on his own truth social platform. The public knows who I am and what a successful presidency I had. I will therefore not be doing the debates. So now on some level, this is true. The public certainly knows who he is. Very powerful guy, big, strong guy, with tears coming down on his face, said, thank you, Mr. President, for saving our country. This happens all the time. My administration has accomplished more than almost any administration in the history of our country. He said, you know, sir, if you want, you're really smart. You ought to take the cognitive test. Did I ace it? Yes, sir. I aced it. And he would argue his presidency stands for itself. Tough on China, a real defender of American values. But his presidency also had major problems. He's been indicted four times this year in New York, in Georgia, and he's facing federal charges in Washington, D.C. and Florida. So imagine him answering questions about his vision, yes, and his record, but also about hush money payments to porn stars, about showing off classified documents, about attempts to steal the last presidential election. He has a whole bunch of opponents who badly need to go after him because he is the runaway favorite. So when you're as far ahead in the polls as Trump is, there's little to gain, lots to lose. And while the whole criminal indictment thing actually works for Trump because his supporters see him as a martyr. These four horrible, radical left Democrat investigations of your all-time favorite president, me. Allowing Republican opponents to chip away at the cracks could be dangerous. He really comes out the winner in not going to this debate. I mean, you have to really wonder why he would go potentially because he would be faced with hard questions, not only from the moderators, but from some of his rivals yes. like Chris Christie, right? So you're leading people by 50 and 60 points and you say, why would you be doing a debate? It's not, it's actually not fair. Why would you let somebody that's at zero or at one or two or three, you know, be popping you with questions? Don't forget, Trump has employed this tactic before. Back in 2016, he skipped the final GOP primary debate and held his own event instead. I did something that was very risky, and I think it turned out great because I'm on the front page of every paper, 
I'm getting more publicity than if I was in the debate. This adds another element to a very complicated relationship between Donald Trump and Fox News. The debate is being hosted by Fox News, and Fox and Donald Trump used to be like this. I must tell you, Fox has treated me fairly. Fox. Fox's coverage of Trump in the Oval Office was pretty favorable. In exchange, Trump often gave them exclusive interviews. He would quote Fox News as a reliable source of information, even hire people who used to work there to work for him. But the relationship really soured on election night 2020. Fox was among the very first networks to declare Trump had lost the state of Arizona, which meant he would ultimately lose the presidency. Arizona, Shoot. are you 100% sure of that call and when you made it and why did you make it? Absolutely. That's when things began to unravel. And fast forward to a few days ago, Trump still hasn't forgiven Fox. From his post on Truth Social, why doesn't Fox and Friends show all of the polls where I'm beating Biden by a lot? They just won't do it. And make no mistake, saying no to the Fox debate will sting. Before Trump was first elected in 2015, a Fox News debate featuring Trump pulled in about 24 million viewers, which is wild because the election cycle before that, they pulled in about 3 million. So Trump gave them like a 700% increase in ratings. The executives were basically pleading with him. You know, they went to, to his Bedminster club and asked him to participate in this debate. We know that on air, the hosts have been encouraging him to participate. And here's the salt in the wound. Trump isn't just dodging the Fox News debate. Instead, he'll do a one-on-one -on -one sit down interview with former Fox News host Tucker Carlson. Those same sources speculate that Trump will air the interview with Carlson around the same time as the debate as part of a counter programming measure for his campaign. That's right. He's competing against Fox, no doubt pulling their viewers away and doing it with one of their own former stars. Even by not going, the debate is all about him. Everyone is going to talk about Trump, and the specter of him not being there is going to hang over it and define the very terms of what happens. His absence, in a way, really sucks the oxygen out of the room because he has all of the focus, none of the risk. And to the extent that that doesn't allow some of these candidates who worked really hard to get on that debate stage to get some notoriety and get people to be familiarized with their candidacy, um, that could be a setback for them as well. So not only are fewer people watching, the candidates are still stuck talking about Trump and less able to focus on their own platforms. Now, no one's saying that Trump's absence can't backfire, right? He'd be letting his opponents attack him for free, in essence. But here's one more thing to consider. Trump, despite saying he's not coming, could still show up. Like, wouldn't that be quite the entrance, right? And Fox News is said to be preparing for that very thing, in the off chance that it does happen. Eight candidates not named Trump are expected on stage tomorrow. A second debate is set for September. This is all part of the ramp up to the 2024 primary season. The party kicks that off with the Iowa caucuses in the middle of January. Seeking safety in Canada through the U.S. It's our mission to work together to, to help. Paul Hunter takes us to a Mexican border crossing where some are risking everything in search of a new life. U.S. officials say they are seeing a spike of illegal crossings along the border with Mexico. In July, they processed more than 180,000 migrant applications despite record heat levels. That is about a 30% increase from June when they saw a two-year low. So most of them are aiming to make new lives in the U.S., but not all. Many have been sold a lie that a free ride to Canada is just beyond the border. Earlier this year, Paul Hunter went to Juarez, Mexico, showing us what these migrants are risking to run north. On the south side of the U.S. border in Juarez, Mexico, desperation is on full display by those 
trying to escape violence and oppression further south. Migrants who fled Central and South America to illegally cross the Rio Grande River into the United States, hoping to then get past that wall. On this day, a collective race for the wall because of a hot rumor heard by everyone. Have you heard the rumor about buses to Canada? That's right. The rumor was that buses with free passage to Canada were waiting on the other side of the wall. It was, of course, completely false. But this month, it brought migrants to the Juarez-El Paso border at all hours. And it underlines that for countless migrants here, the new target is north of America. And for many, the last leg of the journey to Canada begins here. So is this like a, a processing center? This is the Center for Migrant Attention. Consider the work of Enrique Valenzuela. He runs the only government office of its kind in Mexico aimed at helping migrants who fled their home countries. And that's El Paso. That's El Paso. That's where yeah. they want to get. Yes, actually, that's where they want to get. He then took us inside to meet some of those who'd made it this far. Nicaragua, Ecuador, 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 Some have asked not to be identified. All now seek safety and new lives in America and, as it turns out, beyond. Entering and claiming asylum in the U.S. isn't easy. Online forms can be filled out with personal information from those who hope to qualify at a legal crossing point, but it's complicated enough to increasingly turn eyes and dreams elsewhere. Can you ask me how many were trying uh, to get to Canada? Una pregunta. ¿Quiénes de ustedes este, estaban intentando o les interesaría llegar a Canadá? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We're told that on some days there are four to 500 people here, so this is a slow day, but nonetheless sobering. Jeski Urbina and Nelson Ramirez fled political violence in Venezuela six weeks ago. What would we tell the people of Canada, they say? We fled our country because we had to. Please give us a chance in Canada. This is everything. With two knapsacks, now their worldly possessions, they spent $5,000 for part of their journey on top of a freight train. That's you? Mm -hmm. On top of the train? Left behind in Venezuela, their four children, who they hope can follow if they can find security and a life in Canada. What do you say to your children uh, uh, back home? I don't know what to say, she told us. It is heartbreaking. We hear all kinds of stories every day, heartbreaking stories of people that have gone through hardship just to get to this point. It's our mission to work together to, to help. A few blocks away at this Juarez street corner with the cold setting in where the only shelter is whatever you can find, we found Johanna Jimenez, who fled Venezuela last September, too afraid to now go back, unable to get further north. She now lives with her children on the streets. She too had heard that rumor about Canada, and she was among those making a run for the wall that night, only to learn it was fake news. Canada was always our destination, she says. But we're stuck here. Our dream of a better future is Canada. On the other side of Juarez, at a shelter for yet more migrants trying to get north, hot food is on offer daily. And in one of the multiple cramped makeshift bedrooms, these young Venezuelans pass the time 
making music. We're told that it helps to beat back the depression. Yolver Tamares fled Venezuela last summer. My goal is Canada, he says. I feel there are opportunities there for Latinos that the U.S. doesn't offer. I don't want to settle in America, and it's impossible to live in Venezuela. Pastor Miguel Gonzalez runs this place and tells us that migrants here have heard stories about Canada from, for example, Haitians who've already made it through. Their message to those stuck in Juarez? Para las personas que viven en Canada. The message, he says, is that Canada is receptive to people and that migrants are treated well in Canada. And so it is that word continues to spread. But for all, countless challenges remain as the crisis for migrants worsens and desperation for a workaround grows. The thing is, for all the government and bureaucratic roadblocks and the wall, for those who really want to get north, there's always a way. It's a clear reminder that as governments grapple with all of it, there are those who will do whatever it takes. And for those who fail when they try, there will be another day to try again. So Paul Hunter is with us now to give us an update. So Paul, how is the situation in Juarez now? Yeah, I was speaking this afternoon with aid workers in Juarez who say the situation now is certainly better than it was in February. Um, recall back in the spring, the U.S. changed its approach on such migrants, easing up on some regulations, toughening others. With the bottom line, authorities can now take harder action on those who cross illegally. At the same time, processing for legal migrants was streamlined and modernized. The result, as you noted off the top, numbers dipped. But I'm told, at least in the Juarez, El Paso area, they've lately crept up again, though it's hard to tell if that's a bump or a trend. Just listening to you, it, it seems like a pretty safe bet this comes up at tomorrow's Republican debate. Yeah, look, it's certainly an issue Republican politicians like to focus on. And it's, you know, it's important to note that most people would agree with the notion a country just can't let everyone in willy-nilly whenever and wherever they want to cross. There needs to be an orderly process. The Biden administration would argue they're much closer to that now than they were. But the challenge remains because the migrants keep coming legally and otherwise. It may well be that no one says build that wall tomorrow night, but the debate will no doubt cast it as a problem on which Joe Biden has failed, regardless of the numbers right now. Adrian. All right, Paul Hunter in Washington, thank you. You're welcome. Coming up, the 66-year-old wedding dress that's still in fashion. To be like the fifth woman to wear it is definitely an honor. A family's growing tradition in our moment. Marriage ceremonies come with all manner of traditions, like this one, the bride wearing the same dress worn by her mother, her aunt, her grandmother, and great aunt when they got married. So tonight, that Saskatoon family's commitment over multiple generations is our moment. It's a special thing to be able to, to wear and enjoy your mom's wedding dress, let alone like your grandmother's. She wore it in 1957. She bought it from a store in Saskatoon. The very next year, her sister wanted to wear the same dress, so she wore that. In the 80s, my auntie Leslie wore it, and then in the 90s, my mom wore it, and then now me. So it's really cool, and to be like the fifth woman to wear it is definitely an honor. I always grew up seeing it in my mom's closet and always just kind of had a feeling it would work out for me to wear it. We just had minor fixes with little you know, buttons falling off here and there, but besides that, no actual alterations since 1957. And I think I speak for the other women as well, that it just kind of has stood the test of time in terms of its beauty. We hope that the tradition continues, of course, and hope that it remains just timelessly beautiful and that more women in our family would just be as honored as I was to wear it. And they already have cousins lining up to say they'll wear it too. And they just, they still can't get over the fact that they haven't needed that many alterations, that somehow it, it's fit pretty much everyone and still looks so good. That is a national for August 22nd. Thank you for being with us. Have a good night.